Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Gina Ippolito, and this is a breakdown of The Giggle, the third and final episode of the Doctor Who 60th anniversary specials. Eric is on paternity leave, and as the resident Doctor Who nerd at New Rockstars, I'm filling in for this Russell T. Davis penned episode, which was a fitting end for a fan favorite Doctor and companion and a fabulous introduction to 15th Doctor Shuti Gatwa. So let's break this down for all the Easter eggs, references, and ominous lingering threats left hanging in the air. We open in Soho in 1925 as a man walks into the Mr. Emporium toy store. The camera pushes in on the glass, lingering on the words tricks and games, giving us a glimpse of what we'll be getting this episode. Neil Patrick Harris shows up right away as the toy maker, a role he's clearly having a ton of fun with, starting out with an over-the-top German accent. Throughout the episode, he cycles through French, English, and his own American accent. He mentions the game Snakes and Ladders. This was brought to the UK from India in the 1890s, and then Milton Bradley started selling it under the name Shoots and Ladders in the US in the 40s. He says, On the rules. They are very, very important in these rules, don't you think? We find out later that the rules of the game bind the toy maker's entire existence, so he's setting up their importance early on. So, a bit of character history. The toy maker was initially introduced in the first Doctor story, The Celestial Toy Maker. He was played then by Michael Goff. The Doctor and his companions, Stephen and Dodo, are abducted into the realm of the toy maker, who was eternal and super powerful and really liked playing games with anyone he could trap. The three of them survive the games and escape in the TARDIS before the toy maker's realm disappears. Three of the original four episodes of this serial were lost, but the audio survives, which they're using to animate the missing bits, and we see some of the surviving footage later on in this episode. Charlie tells the toy maker he wants to buy this doll, Stooky Bill, and holy crap is he terrifying. He's surrounded by his doll wife, Stooky Sue, and three Stooky babies who are all just the stuff of nightmares. The toy maker is famous for threatening to turn people into toys, which he does in this episode and also in some books and comics, so it's possible that the Stooky Bill doll used to be a living person who lost a game, and that would be extra horrifying given that he has this family, which would mean the toy maker basically killed them all. Pleasant dreams, everyone! Charlie asks if the hair on the doll is real, something that they actually used to do on occasion, and the toy maker responds that it is, and he cut it off the head of a beautiful lady, but she wouldn't miss it. And dude, Charlie, run! The toy maker does this very creepy laugh that becomes a major plot point and is the titular giggle of the episode. <laughs> He wraps the doll up in brown paper, the same kind that Charlie is wrapped up in later, and we get a good look at this creepy doll behind him whose mouth is open in a perpetual scream. Charlie says he works for John Logie Baird. He was a real-life Scottish inventor who introduced the television to the world in 1926, using as the first image he transmitted the head of a ventriloquist dummy named Stooky Bill. So you can see where this is going. Back in Baird's workshop, the image of Bill on the TV is giving me very distinct jigsaw vibes. Charlie asks him how hot it is under the lights, and Baird says, That's why we need Stooky Bill. No man could sit under underneath that temperature. And poor Bill's head starts to melt, and this is all based on what actually happened. Baird had to use a lot of lights to light the subject, and the hair of the doll did actually singe and its plaster cracked. But Baird also chose to use a painted doll with a high contrast face because he was worried that human faces wouldn't have enough contrast for their features to be picked up by the photoelectric cells. As Stooky Bill catches fire, mouth agape, we hear the repeated giggle that takes us into the opening credits. And then we're back in the present day, right after the events of the ending of Wild Blue Yonder with chaos in the streets. We see people looting, screaming at each other, driving all over the place, there's even a pickup truck forcibly pushing a car up the street, its driver honking frantically. And as the doctor walks through it all, taking it in, we see the toy maker now looking very cabaret in the background, dancing around a guy holding a the end is nigh sign. A man explains to the doctor that two days ago, everyone started thinking they're right all the time. And who boy, we are in for some good old Russell T. Davis commentary on modern times. And I'm here for it. The toy maker now doing a French accent, tries to get the doctor to dance with him. And again, I just love how much fun Neil Patrick Harris is having with all of this chaos around him. Donna stands off to the side with her granddad in his wheelchair, but they're careful not to show his face. That's because Bernard Cribbins passed away before he was able to film anything for this episode. When Unit shows up, we hear his voice say, that's actually Cribbins' audio reused from the season four episode, The Poison Sky. Don't listen to her. You go with the doctor. Unit uses a helicopter to tow the TARDIS, something we also saw on the day of the Doctor, the 50th anniversary special, when the 11th Doctor and Clara were actually still inside. Unit headquarters is looking distinctively Avengers Towery now, with its own helipad and everything. They might want to rethink this design scheme since it didn't work out too well for the Avengers. Unit scientific advisor Shirley Ann Bingham greets them and 14 says, Shirley, you can't be serious. A nod to the movie Airplane. Shirley, you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Kate Lethbridge Stewart joins them, and the doctor says, I remember your father working night and day to keep units secret, and look at you now. But she's just out here in public defending the Earth. Her dad, Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, played by Nicholas Courtney, first popped up in a second doctor story. He then became close friends with the third doctor and appeared in at least 23 episodes of the original run. His final appearance was in a seventh doctor episode, and the 11th doctor learned of his death in the wedding of River Song. He was one of only a few close friends the doctor invited to see him before his supposed death. The brigadier also later got resurrected as 
a Cyberman, and finally got some closure on their relationship, even getting a much desired salute from the 12th Doctor. Kate says, Robots and insects and yetis and clones, but what do we do this time, Doctor? Okay, so the robots she mentions are probably the Cybermen with the 12th Doctor in Death in Heaven, the aforementioned episode with her dad as a Cyberman. Insects might be the Rarth warriors from the first special, the Star Beast. Yeti, this is kind of a deep cut, but I think she came into contact with Yetis during the 1995 spinoff Downtime. Clones is a reference to the Zygon invasion and the Osgood doubles. The Doctor is handed some intel by none other than Mel, played by Bonnie Langford. Melanie Bush, companion of Colin Baker's sixth Doctor and Sylvester McCoy's seventh. She showed up briefly in a support group scene in Power of the Doctor, but now she's properly back, it seems. Mel was a computer programmer from the 20th century, and Who fans weren't huge on her, but she was peppy and positive and had big curly hair, so I felt a kinship with her. At the end of season 24, when Ace is introduced in Dragonfire, Mel goes off with a mercenary named Sabalom Glitz to keep him in line during his space adventures. Because of a lot of convoluted stuff going on with the show and the BBC at the time, Mel is one of the only companions who never got an origin story in terms of how she started traveling with the Doctor. You could argue Susan, the Doctor's granddaughter, never got one either, but Carol Ann Ford, the actress who played her, has said she doesn't consider Susan a companion. Don't come at me in the comments, I'm just repeating what she said. Mel's send-off was also kind of abrupt due to Colin Baker leaving the role before the show could go back and film their meeting. Mel isn't the first of the Doctor's ex-companions to take a job with Unit, and we later see that she won't be the last. Donna expresses her dislike of the term companion and asks, I wasn't the first redhead? The Doctor has also traveled with redhead Amy Pond, and several times he expressed a desire to be ginger after regenerating. We get a little bit of exposition about what's going on and why everyone in the world is so angry. We meet the Vlinks, who created the Z-Dex, which allows the wearer to be unaffected by the brain spike, causing everyone to go all Alex Jones throwing a fit. Kate deactivates hers in order to show the Doctor what they're dealing with, and then we get a surprising but absolutely delightful cameo from Trinity Wells, played by Lachelle Carl. From 2005 to 2010, when Davis was showrunner, Wells always popped up on TV reporting on news anytime there was alien activity. She also appeared in Torchwood and the Sarah Jane Adventures, making her one of the few actors who's appeared as the same character in all three shows. Fans were thrilled to see Wells again, since she was always a favorite. Shirley says that the COSAT, the satellite that two days ago gave internet access to every person on Earth, is clean and there's nothing hiding in the signal like there was in the old Archangel network. That was the network used for mind control to help the Harold Saxon master get elected. Donna figures out that the seven peaks in the wavelength spike are musical notes. She really is brilliant. And I love watching Tate shine. And Mel adds that it's a classic arpeggio. They discover the giggle in everyone's head, hiding in the image of Stooky Bill on the TV. The doctor says that this manipulation doesn't let the human race off the hook. All the anger out there on the street, the lies, the righteousness, that's human, that's you. This type of speech is where Tennant and Doctor Who have always shined, holding a mirror up to society, even as we prepare to go online and spew more vitriol, perhaps about this very episode. The Toymaker's plan of infecting screens with an evil doll reminds me of the 10th Doctor episode, The Idiot's Lantern, in which an evil electrical alien known as The Wire is using TVs to steal people's energy so it can regrow its body. There was also a story written for the 1986 season of Doctor Who that never aired called The Nightmare Fair that would have shown the Toymaker creating an arcade game that sucks up the souls of its players. A novelization of that script was eventually released. The Doctor gives Unit his permission to use their galvanic beam to take out the satellite. He can do this because he was inducted as president of Earth in Death in Heaven. He catches up with Mel, who smiles a huge smile when he calls her brilliant, which I just love. She traveled with Sabalom Glitz until he died at 101 by tripping over a whiskey bottle, a very fitting end for him. Kate offers Donna a job at Unit for 60,000 a year. 120 plus five weeks holiday. Done. I love Donna so much. She and the doctor head to Soho in 1925 and we get this cool shot from down the alley of the TARDIS materializing and you can see the interior as they exit. They're making use of those bigger budgets by trying some new stuff. Donna mentions Mel, who she likes a lot, which is in keeping with her attitude when she met Martha Jones. The doctor was worried at the time that the women would be jealous of one another like Rose and Sarah Jane were when they first met. Donna mentioning that the doctor has never brought up Mel is both in character, but serves to remind us that since she wasn't one of the more popular companions, she was sort of left out of reminiscences over the years. As Donna gives this speech about the doctor wearing himself out, Tennant actually does show his age. He hasn't shaved, he looks a bit haggard, and he's definitely got more lines on his face than we remember. The toy maker plays peekaboo with 14 as he looks in the shop and starts juggling as they enter. Again, Neil Patrick Hare is showing off one of his many skills. He says that the ball is the first game ever invented, setting up the climactic ball toss later. We get to see colorized footage from the classic era celestial toy maker, and this is the first time we hear his name uttered in this episode. The toy maker. Then we get another arpeggio giggle from the toy maker as he hides. This long hallway but the nondescript doors reminds me of the Minotaur Hotel in the God Complex, with each door hiding something terrifying. Donna touches on some of their adventures together, saying she's seen Ood, Davros, and the Adipose, but this is something different. She asks what the toy maker is, and 14 responds, When I was young, 
I was so sure of myself. I made a terrible mistake. I know I just said that he's showing his age, but it's funny to hear the perpetually boyish tenant talk about William Hartnell's doctor being young since he looked exceedingly older. Although yes, obviously in the world of the show, the first doctor was at least hundreds of millions of years younger than 14. A mysterious vault teeming with danger and wonder has opened. Are you ready to embark on this secret journey to explore the relics and ruins? Now Magic the Gathering is letting you take on the role of legendary explorer Lara Croft with their new secret lair collaboration. This secret lair drop is awesome. It's got fan favorite cards like Shadow Spear and Academy Ruins with Tomb Raider inspired art, plus an all new mechanically unique Lara Croft Tomb Raider card. This drop is available exclusively through the Secret Lair website. It's got six cards total, plus a treasure token. And even better, the Secret Lair Tomb Raider drop is available now. Just click the link in the description below and get yours today. The Toymaker was led into reality this time by 14 casting salt at the edge of the universe in Wild Blue Yonder, something he was worried would come back to bite him in the butt. I invoked a superstition at the edge of the universe. In true Who fashion, the Doctor and Donna get separated and he encounters Charlie, who lost a game to the toy maker and was turned into a puppet. Meanwhile, Donna enters a room inhabited by Stooky Sue, who speaks in terrifying rhymes. He won't come home to me, because they burn him on TV. And the Stooky Babbies, who descend from the ceiling like spiders. But Donna just faced down the not things at the end of the universe, so she has got it handled. She smashes the widow and threatens the babies, and I could just watch Donna kick ass and spout off one-liners all day. My name's Donna. No, I think that you're a goner. She's reunited with the doctor in the Toymaker's theater, which kind of gave me Coraline vibes when she's in the theater in the other mother's realm. The Toymaker puts on a puppet show featuring the stories of Amy Pond, Clara Oswald, Bill Potts, and the Flux. So I'll run through all of those real quick in super basic strokes, not gonna go into all the details and nuances. Amy Pond's husband, Rory, was sent back in time by the touch of a weeping angel. They feed off the time of those they've displaced, and so Amy turned her back to the same angel, begging it to send her to be with Rory. The doctor couldn't cross her timeline, so he never saw her again, but she did write to him using the prologue of a book she knew he'd read. Clara flew off with a shielder, aka me, her last second of life frozen after the events of Face the Raven when she transferred someone else's death sentence to herself. She will eventually need to go back to Gallifrey to actually die. The doctor's memories of his time with her were wiped, but then he ultimately got them back. Bill got turned into a Cyberman, but didn't realize it. Heather, a woman Bill had a connection with who then got turned into like a sentient oil slick thing, came back for her and turned her into the same oil slick like thing. And then they took off together. So a version of Bill still exists out there. The Flux was the universe wide apocalypse from 13 time. The companions of the modern era, especially the Moffat years, often faced much worse fates than earlier companions. In the classic era, a lot of them just left, like Mel. Or they went home, like Sarah Jane, Ian, and Barbara. One of them dying, like when Adric sacrificed himself, was incredibly rare. But in the modern era, the Doctor has faced a lot of loss these past few years, and this show really hammers that home. The mention of all of those tragedies also successfully baits the Doctor into challenging the toy maker. They face off like gunslingers at high noon, and we get to see Harris do some close-up card tricks. It's really awesome seeing these two play off of each other. The toy maker speaks of all those he's played games with, saying he gambled with God and turned him into a jack-in-the-box. So the toy maker's background in Doctor Who has always been a bit murky. In his original episode, it seemed like he was being set up to be one of the then unnamed race of Time Lords, but since then, depending on the Doctor, there have been different explanations, ranging from just a nameless entity to one of the Guardians of Time, who were masters of reality that predate the creation of the universe and in some cases are the same species as God, although they too seem to have different properties depending on the media being referenced. We've seen some Guardians before, in episodes like The Armageddon Factor and Enlightenment. It was cool and weird and reminds me of the Portlandia sketch, put a bird on it. Later on, the Toymaker says he played against the Guardians and shrank them into voodoo dolls. Anyway, it's definitely possible that the Toymaker did meet God or a God and bested them in a game. He then says, The master was dying. I sealed him for all eternity inside my gold tooth. We last saw the master as the spy master in The Power of the Doctor, where he tried to regenerate into the Doctor. He was thwarted, crushed by a boulder, and left to die on a planet that was about to explode, so I'm guessing that this is when he tried to play a game with the toy maker and lost. He continues. There's only one player I didn't dare face, the one who waits. I'll get into some theories on this a little later. The toy maker and the doctor decide to cut cards and the doctor loses. The character on the king card the toy maker turns over looks like the original toy maker from the classic run. The doctor points out that they're technically tied since the last time they met, he was the winner. And then the set starts collapsing in on itself in this super cool effect. The whole toy store folds up into the box that they later use to put the toy maker in, in a deep vault bound in salt somewhere where I assume the Ark of the Covenant is also stored. The galvanic beam takes out the satellite, and then we get probably my favorite scene of the whole episode. In the middle of the doctor giving a very doctory speech, he's interrupted by the Spice Girls, Spice Up Your Life. And as someone who went to the theater to see Spice World opening weekend, I was very excited by this. The toy maker enters the scene like a Broadway hurricane, reminding me of the master's Rasputin routine in Power of the Doctor. He lip syncs, he dances, he turns bullets into rose petals, he kills people by turning them into colorful balls, and then he disappears with a flourish and a clown horn honk, and just shoot this straight into my eyeballs forever. The toy maker hijacks the beam, and the doctor tries to convince him to 
come travel the stars with him. We can be celestial. An obvious nod to the title of the original serial, but the toy maker turns him down, preferring Earth's humans and all the games they play. And then he shoots 14. The doctor starts radiating regeneration energy and Donna and Mel each take one of his hands. This music starts playing that was the same music that played over the ninth doctor's regeneration. And then Mel says, Cause every single one of you is fantastic. Fantastic. That was one of Nine's favorite catchphrases. 14 says, here we go again, which was what Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart said in Planet of the Spiders when three was regenerating. And he also says, feels different this time, which was what the fifth doctor said when he was regenerating. That was actually Peter Davison, David Tennant's father-in-law. He says his catchphrase, Alon Z, meaning let's go, which contrasts with I don't want to go, which is what number 10 said the last time this happened. And then we get the moment that everyone has been talking about since this aired, the first ever by generation As Donna and Mel each pull an arm, 15 splits out of 14, we get another round of What? 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 And then Shuti Gatwa starts cooking. He immediately brings a ton of joy and energy to the role as the camera spins up and around them, this plot point literally upending all the lore we thought we knew. 15 wastes no time in setting himself apart. He tells 14 to push, and then they separate, each wearing half the other one's clothes, with 14 wearing the undershirt, vest, and pants, and 15 wearing the button-up, tie, sneakers, and underwear. And sorry to point out the obvious, but this means that 14 is currently going commando. Mel tells 15 he's beautiful, and he really is, you guys. Both doctors challenge the toy maker, and they play the first game, catch. The three have a grand old time throwing and running and bending and snapping, and eventually the toy maker loses and is banished from existence, folding in on himself and getting shut up in his box, but not before saying this. My legions are coming. 15 and Donna tell a contemplative 14 that he can't save everyone and the deaths aren't his fault, and then 15 gives him the most healing hug you'll ever see. Come in, I've got you. There's even a little kiss on the forehead that's so cute. The gold tooth containing the master is picked up by hand with red nail polish, and we hear the audio of multiple incarnations of master voices layered over one another. <laughs> 15 convinces 14 that it's time to rest and work on himself by bringing up just some of the stuff he's been through. They mention Adric, River Song, Sarah Jane being gone, Rose, the Time War, Pandorica, Mavic Chen, and the Gods of Ragnarok. Whew, okay, here we go. How fast can I speed through these? Put on Trial is from Trial of a Time Lord. The sixth Doctor was put on trial for breaking the laws of Gallifrey, but in the end, he was found not guilty. It was number six's last serial before regenerating. Exiled refers to the second Doctor being exiled by the Time Lords and forced to regenerate. Legopolis was the name of a serial and planet visited by the fourth Doctor. Doctor. The Doctor and the Master team up to stop the universe unraveling, but the Master ultimately betrays him, causing number four to fall from a great height and regenerate. Adric was a companion of the fourth and fifth Doctor. He sacrificed himself on board a ship that collided with Earth and killed the dinosaurs. River Song, one of my favorite characters, has a whole long backstory, but is ultimately the child of Rory and Amy Pond, who was trained to assassinate the Doctor, but eventually became his wife. Sarah Jane Smith was a favorite companion who got her own spin-off, the Sarah Jane Adventures, and passed away a few years ago. The Time War was a massive war fought by the Eighth and War Doctors against the Daleks. The Doctor thought it resulted in the death of both Time Lords and Daleks, but both parties managed to survive. The Pandorica was a cube prison meant to trap the Doctor. It did trap Eleven, but he managed to escape by creating a time paradox. Mavic Chen was an enemy of the first Doctor. He was a politician titled Guardian of the Solar System and sided with the Daleks against humanity until they eventually killed him. The Gods of Ragnarok were supremely powerful beings known as Old Ones. They ran a psychic circus and forced people to perform for their entertainment. The Seventh Doctor was able to turn their power against them and destroyed their physical connection to our universe. Okay. So 14 tells 15 that despite all of that, 15 seems fine. And 15 says, I'm fine because you fix yourself. To me, this indicates that despite the bi-generation and everything we don't know about it, 14 will still eventually regenerate into 15. Donna tells the doctor that she can help him stay in one place and just live. The one adventure he's never had. He changed his face, then he came and found her, and she knows why. The only sticking point is that the doctor could never let the TARDIS go, his one constant through all the years. But 15 has a fix for that too. He uses the toy maker's mallet to create a second TARDIS out of the first, and 14 is officially out of excuses. 15 tries to take off without saying goodbye, but 14 knows his tricks. They hug and salute one another before 15 kicks everyone out of his TARDIS and flies off into space. And 14 stays put with his family, mostly. He's definitely been stealing off with Mel and Donna on the odd adventure. I just love this ending so much. My takeaway from this is that even someone like the Doctor, who's millions of years old, can learn to fix himself and grow and appreciate everything he has. That's a powerful message. And despite thinking he'd be endlessly bored, 14 says, I've never been so happy in my life. Now, I've seen some people arguing that the Doctor 
already had a family, has had families, Susan, Amy, and Rory, other companions. But in my mind, this is all about how those other iterations of the Doctor weren't ready to settle down. But now with everything he's been through, he finally is, for a bit at least. So some strings left dangling. I guess we're just waiting now for the Toymaker's legions to show up. It would be awesome to see 15 fighting off a bunch of sentient toys, but maybe there are other legions I'm not thinking of. We still don't know who the Meep's boss is that was mentioned in the Star Beast, but I'm guessing that that's going to be the same as the one who waits that the Toymaker mentioned. There are a few theories out there on who this might be. The Eternals, Omega, a Shilder, even Amy or Rory, since they both were the ones who waited at some point. I think it's a whole new big bad original creation of Russell T. Davis though. Also, who picked up the master in the gold tooth? Kate Lethbridge-Stewart had red nails, similar to the ones on the hand that we saw, but I'm really hoping that this is the hand of the Ronnie, who I'd love to see return from the classic Who days. Up next will be the 2023 Christmas special, which will be Shooty's first proper episode of The Doctor, and the trailer looks like a freaking delight. So I'm very excited about that. Let me know in the comments if you are too and what you thought of the Doctor Who 60th anniversary specials. Thank you so much to the awesome Noah Chen for helping research and write this episode. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Gina Ippy. Follow new rock stars, subscribe to new rock stars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.